Manchester is actually big enough to <laughs> to to carry it off, you know, to sort of dedicate your whole life to yeah. it, you know. Yeah. You know, with somewhere like Coventry, it's not, <laughs> not quite as easy. <laughs> well, we often talk about that, fun enough, you know, about the Midlands not quite having the same myth of well, it's not as big, know. that's the that's thing. Even it Birmingham it's practical. is not yeah, as big. It's yeah, it's you haven't got such a wide yeah. catchment area of talent or whatever, you know. It's yeah. like, I think that was... I mean, funny enough, this band now... It's taken me like 30 years. This is the band I should have put together when the specials broke up. Because I, I had that, that you know, what's the word for it? Civic, you know, that loyalty to Coventry. So I picked yeah. the special AKA more or less entirely from Coventry. And, you know, sadly there wasn't the, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a small. So how many did you find then? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> So what did you go on the hunt for then when you um, in Coventry? What were you looking for? Well, I was looking for obviously people to um, to try and continue what the specials w was doing, but um, yeah, and um, that was quite a tall order really, and there was a lot of pressure on me at the time as well because I felt I had to come up with this third album. You know, there's no time for it, so it was all done back to front. You know, we're in the studio, um, spending loads of money, yeah. not knowing that the record company actually owned the studio, <laughs> so, or not realising. Did you have a similar concept for it even then, or did that come later? Um, well, that special AKA had sort of slight jazzy influences, I suppose. Uh, I'm not a jazz musician. I love jazz, but I wouldn't class myself as a jazz musician. But um, there was a great band at that time, the Lounge Lizards, who, you know, invented this thing called fake jazz. So that meant I felt like, oh, I can have a go at this as well. And yeah. it doesn't... And in some ways, although it was fake jazz, it was more jazz than real jazz because the thing about jazz is that it's not jazz. Good jazz isn't jazz. It's the next stage on, you know, if what, you see what I mean. Yeah, what is it then? What is it, good jazz? Well, that all comes from jazz is the search for the... Uh, the blue note or the unexpected note in a solo, you know, that's what, and also the unexpected music. So, you know, the great jazz musicians always were pushing forward into the next, it's the art of the unexpected, you know, that was what it was anyway, mm. whether you could still say that now, a hundred years into its, uh, you know, since it was invented, but, um, you know, so, the, there's something, I mean, that's also why I like Sunro, he's an absolute master Jazz pianist, one of the greats, mm. uh, but he also sort of invented fake jazz because he he said he was into tones, not notes. So he's really into the sound of the the keyboard, especially the electronic keyboard. He's one of the few jazz musicians that mixed um, jazz with European electronic music or electronica, which was, I suppose, mainly classical when it started. But. Um, but Joe Meek and people like that. There was also that idea of, of using music as a as a way to invent yourself, to, to create you know other realities, if you like, and to and to transcend limitations. And, it, and 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 I've always felt with him it was the ultimate metaphor for transcending literally earthbound limitations. You know, a lot of people kind of got a bit confused about the whole stick of it. But 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 it was a really powerful metaphor, really, for for looking for otherness, wasn't it? Obviously, it was a political thing. You know, going to the moon. It was to show that the Americans were more powerful, more everything than the Russians and of course the Russians had to to uh, catch up or try and catch up and uh, Sun Ra I guess sort of symbolically or poetically was kind of saying um, well black people are completely excluded from this which they were and so we don't need rockets mm. to travel through space you know as we can travel through space just as uh, in, a, in some sense just as real in your own mind or through music because mm. You know, the dent that the Americans meant made on, <laughs> on outer space was a little bit yeah, small, yeah. you know. <laughs> and I think that's what he was kind of he, saying. He was sort of suggesting alternative ways to explore outer space, literally. Yeah, 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 yeah. literally. I mean, that's what he was doing. And when you actually think about it, it's like I say, you know, you can explore outer space by going like that yeah. as much as you can by going to the moon in a rocket, you know, because yeah. it's so vast. You yeah. Know? So how did you, first of all, how did you 
get interested in jazz? What was your first way into jazz? And then how did that get to Sun Ra? Well, I've always loved jazz. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm quite old. I used to watch jazz at the Maltings on a Sunday night. Um, I just always loved jazz, you know, right from the, the 60s, from when I was a kid. I don't mm. know why, I just did, you know, so. And I guess I've always been aware of Sun Ra. He's just sort of, he's got a very special place amongst musicians as representing a certain kind of uh, creativity, uh, yes. uncompromising. And also the whole black self-sufficiency thing, the do-it-yourself thing, almost 50, 60 years ahead of hip-hop in a way. With, yeah. But it's a similar, th the, you know, the, the different names, the masks, the, the kind of the, never wanted to be fixed down, constantly inventing. This, this, this idea of self-invention is, is just so contemporary now, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And also, it actually goes back a long, you know, if you want to get into deep, it goes back a long way to um, the whole thing of carnival. You know, the, the carnival was the day where the slaves were allowed to mock their masters in dance mm. and dress. And, you know, I think a lot of that tradition actually carried right through black music and culture and dressing up was always a part of it. Duke Ellington had dancers. The bands always looked great, you know. Yeah. But we are gonna, the next phase we're gonna dress as geography teachers, you know. <laughs> you had enough of the masks, of it, <laughs> the dressing up. Well, you know, a lot of jazz musicians look like geography yeah, teachers, yeah, but yeah. We're, we're on a real geography lesson in, in jazz. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're doing the musical side. They can do the, the visual side of the geography lesson. Uh, and how did it end up that you, you, I mean, you jokingly refer to it as a Sun Ra tribute band, orchestra yeah. tribute band, but. It is, it is a hell of a, of, a, of, a, of a dedication, if you like, to uh, as much as there's many minds within his mind, it's still a dedication to one man's mind. It's a hell of a dedication to make. Well, why, in the end, did you feel so obliged to do that or so kind of motivated to do that? I just, you know, over the years, I've listened to all sorts of music and I guess, you know, Sunrise Band just, yeah, over the, you know, 30, 40, 50 years or whatever, it, it's just the coolest band ever, you know, you just can't get away from it. It's got everything, it has everything. And it's, you know, still I listen to stuff and I just think, how was he doing that at that time? There's a track in 1949 that sounds exactly like the JBs. There's stuff that sounds like hip hop years before hip hop. Yeah. There's stuff that sounds like, you know, you even hear snatches of rave music or anything. It's like, he really made that manifesto believable, but also he was kind of, you know, he showed that, you know, making really great out there music's got nothing to do with being young for a start. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nothing to do with taking drugs, yeah. to, nothing to do with being slim, which yeah. is helpful. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that inspired me. <laughs> he said um, that the, the one way, in a way, to just save the world from destroying itself was through music. And I wondered yeah. how much you, you truly believed in that, because it's something that we're losing a lot at the moment, that music's used as, as decoration, as, as a sort of purely light entertainment. But that idea that music has such a, a, an important moral, emotional, social, intellectual, mystical value. Yeah. I wondered how much of th that was part of, of why you've taken on his, his, his baton, if you like. I suppose you could say that, that um, you know, Western white people, with thrown out religion, they've also thrown out the baby with the bathwater to some extent. And I've heard stuff in jazz. I mean, when I first heard John Coltrane live at the Village Gate, I so suddenly realised this is this is really <laughs> something else, you know, that we really don't um, know what's going on here. But it's yeah. pretty. It was kind of um, that was funny enough at the time of the uh, the special, aka album I was in a staying in a caravan in in Germany in a snow you know as snowstorm and I listened to this record and I suddenly realized this is like this is something else so I suppose it is I suppose it relates back to African music really when I got into this there's a track on an album called Languidity I was actually trying to give up smoking dope and I was finding it quite hard yeah and then I listened to this album and somehow it it, it it did for me what what you know yeah. smoking dope had done before. It kind of filled that gap, and you, mm. the, I realised there's ways of getting out out there mm. through music. And I think that's what 
jazz really is. I mean, it's that thing of being gone. You know, some people have never experienced that, but that thing of the unexpected, yeah. playing tricks with your mind and scrambling your brain up, and uh, it's a, a drug-free yeah, yeah. way of getting there. Yeah. Do you think the further we go into the 21st century, the, the, the immense complexity of his mind and his music starts to make a little bit more sense that we can start to realise what he was up to. Like you say, a lot of things he was planting, we now have names for, genre names for. We can say, oh, he was doing, it sounds like hip-hop, sounds like early electro, it sounds like, you know, psychedelia. It's like it's all forming, and, and, and in retrospect, you know, for a while he was kind of exiled from any serious consideration, but, but the more that time goes on and the more that things start to actually fragment and reality starts to fragment, Sun Ra seems to make more sense. Those guys kind of invented the music of the 21st century, so we owe them. The, we, mm. the least we can do is try and play it, you know, <laughs> as we're there now, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, he's, he, he does, he astonishes me, you know, and especially the more you listen, the, there's mm. so many aspects to his, his music that, um, you know, the what. You know, what this band has concentrated on is like the African, more African, more rhythmic, more funky side of it, which yeah. wasn't really taken on board by kind of the avant-garde, but that's a huge part of it that people don't... And there's so many albums to explore and so many amazing things. And also the the whole... Les Baxter, you know, he was hugely influenced by Les Baxter, believe it or not, and... Uh, he saw that as the way forward. The soundscapes and the, uh, you know, the exotica was a huge influence on him, as it was on reggae as well. It was also a, a weird way that using, utilising Sun Ra and his his propensity for masks and, and 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 different ways of representing himself and inventing himself, really useful for you in terms of who you'd become and what people, the expectations people had of you. Yeah, but also showing another side of me. I mean, you know that, you know, that big war between punk and, you know, prog rock and everything, it's like saying, well, now in the fullness of time, can we yeah. move beyond that now? Yeah, yeah. And the, the best way to do that is by looking not at prog rock, which wasn't really progressive and wasn't really rock, but, you know, but by looking at what, where that music actually came from and the jazz musicians who really invented that stuff, you know. Yeah, but has it also been liberating for you as a kind of weird celebrity as well, that you can, you can sort of disappear into this immense universe, uh, yeah, well, even though people are kind of looking you, to you for something else, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, that whole thing of wearing the costumes, I mean, it's a cliche and the masks and everything, you know, if you wear a mask, you see the real person, you know, that's the old cliche, but it's actually <laughs> true. And, um, you know, it is quite liberating. You know, I've, I've, for years I've had real stage fright. I could walk on the stage wearing a Tutankhamen Carmen mask and do all that, that sort of avant-garde synth noise, which I'd be probably too shy to do if I wasn't wearing a, yeah. a Tutankhamen mask. And I think all the musicians, it's, it's, you know, I think that's part of the reason he got them to dress up. It is kind of, you can't take yourself too seriously, can you? In a <laughs> toot and calm and mask and a sequin robe, you know. Well, you can, but... <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty serious. <laughs> but how, how much did you become a completist in terms of trying to track down, you know, all the, all the music and you how... You can't, the that's yeah. the great thing about yeah. it. One of his great quotes, he said that, you know, the, the world should be renamed and the, the interview said, what? What should we name it then? They said Sun Ra. <laughs> <laughs> he had a great, he had a fantastic sense of humour, you know, and he was yeah. a really, really lovely guy. There's a great story um, about he was a conscientious objector in the, you know, in the Second World War, which was, you know, whatever you think of that, it was, uh, there were very few black people mm. in America who were, and they, they put him in a, a camp, and he he protested because he couldn't do his music, and this and uh, so he carried on protesting. So they took him to court, and he went to court to try and protest getting out of this thing. And uh, so the argument, the the judge was quite impressed, but then the judge said, "So what church do you belong to?" So he he couldn't name an actual church. So then the judge, the it started going against him. So Sunra said, "Well, all right then." If you teach me to kill, I'll kill my my own officer. And the judge went mad. And 
So instead of being in a camp, he then put him in prison, you know. And uh, and he, the judge said, I ain't never seen a nigger like you before. And Son Ra said, no, and you won't again. <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking brilliant. That's 1940, whatever it was, 39, 40, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's just a lovely guy, a really lovely guy, you know, that you warm to if you if you study him, you know. Do you think, is this something that you will continue to do for a long time or do you think it will it will just run its course? Is this a major commitment to the reimagining of Sun Ra? It's not just Sun Ra, we, we've, we, well, it was also a tribute to tribute bands because uh, I love tribute bands, yeah. well, they're weird. And yeah. uh, apparently they even have uh, tribute band groupies. Have you heard about this? Oh, this is too weird, you know. <laughs> Marry unfaithful, you know. So you made the tribute to the most ridiculous band likely to have a tribute band. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I thought if you're going to have a tribute band, why not have a tribute band to someone who's actually good in the first place, you know. <laughs> and that was the, the thinking behind yeah. it. Because, yeah. uh, you know, so I had this kind of idea that it should only be cover versions, but I'm, I, we've actually do one a piece of original material now. Oh my God, yeah. and I've even got a modern synthesizer. Yeah. I don't know whether it's gonna <laughs> go downhill, but um, yeah, so, but we also cover other related artists who, you know, uh, mm. Alice Coltrane, mm -hmm. yeah. Cedric Brooks, um, uh, um, some strange European library music as well. So mm. it's, the whole thing's come from um, from my obsession with, you know, tracking down obscure records and stuff. So um, it's come from the DJing thing. Yeah. And what, what you, that idea of what you just said is really interesting because the, the idea of being the DJ, curating music, having musical taste for our generation especially, once upon a time, it was quite a, 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 a rare thing in a way, wasn't it? There was a few nerds. But now the world has turned into kind of everybody doing that in a way. Everybody's yeah. doing that kind of thing. You know, they're creating their own private space. Yeah, so uh, that's why I've gone one step on and done yeah, it Yeah, I was live, just going to say, you know? <laughs> in a way, still proving you, that you have a specialist skill. Because <laughs> everybody can do it now. It's f trying to find a place that, that you can show off that, that in, in fact, you, you're not, you know, you, you've, got, you've got something else to, to, to demonstrate. Well, it is, I mean, I've, oh, I've said that before, you know, people think of the the specials as a ska band, but it's also a cut, it was also a, like a cutting edge retro band. It's just that happened that ska was mm. the cutting edge of retro at the time. So I like people maybe from this or see what I was, what I'm really doing, you know, a bit clearer, you know. So, um, you know, it's taking bits of the past and all the kind of, you know, the stuff that you find in, in markets and stuff and then putting a, a new slant on it, you know, mm. so it's kind of, um, yeah, cutting edge retro. But the great thing about Sunra was that it was also futuristic, <laughs> so that's like another twist to the, yeah. the story. Yeah. But, um, you know, music is dead, as you know, but it's fun to, <laughs> st <laughs> it's fun to stick electrodes <laughs> in the corpse and watch it twitch a bit, you know, that's like... That's my kind it, of you, 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 you kind of think it is, though, or do you think it, it might have an afterlife? I think it's having an afterlife, you know, a weird afterlife. Maybe it's because people like you are sticking electrodes <laughs> in, you know. I mean, everything's... Well, as you know, we were, we were in a, a strange time. You know, Sherlock Holmes would have a job finding out what's at number one in the pop charts, you know what I mean? It's like everything's just kind of dissipated into a million tiny pieces because I mm. mean pop music was actually funnily enough dependent on uh, public broadcasting by the BBC you know there's one Radio 1 and that's it and everybody listened and everybody watched Top of the Pop so everybody knew what the hell was going on now mm. nobody knows what the hell is going on. You still have some kind of faith in, in the possibility that it can it can, you know, demonstrate how you can use music to transcend limitations. I think all that's really fascinating, that idea that the great music creates an alternate reality. The bad music merely confirms the reality with all its flaws. And at the moment, the, 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 there is this possibility that, that, that great music suggesting an alternate reality is really, imp it's, it's the most important time for that to be, to, to happen. It's like what I said before. I mean, Ginger Spice entertaining the troops and it's like, 
you can imagine those Taliban thing. Why have you banned music? And all they've got to do is point, you know. So <laughs> that is why we banned music, you know. So she was recruiting for the Taliban at the same time, you know, yeah. because it's like th there's nothing that we're in a kind of decadent mess, you know, mm. <laughs> of money making. It's all about money. You know? uh, 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 do you have optimism about it, though? Do you, have you got any optimism? Um, well, you have to have optimism, yeah. I mean, the concert is kind of mm. quite pessimistic, but then we have things like Journey in Satch and Dandan, and you have to have some optimism beyond it. We do a song called It's After the End of the World uh, at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they always have some sort of renter, renter, uh, uh, a kind of reactionary bigot on the culture show? <laughs> There's always a token one yeah, at no, the BBC, I, you know, it's I like, know. when are we going to get past that? I've you been know, noticing please, that as BBC. Well. You don't have to have a reactionary bigot on every single <laughs> programme, you know. <laughs>